All right, sit back, relax. It's time for another Laneway Talks. We're here today with Phil Manning, one of uh, our artists at Laneway Music. How are you, Phil? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, how are you? I'm very good, and it's great to um, to have you on our podcast. Uh, so as we always start, Phil, we go through a bit of a chronological order, but let's just see, where did you grow up first? That's always our starting point. Well, number one, I never did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. uh, I grew up I grew up in uh, Devonport, Tasmania, where I went to school and everything. And then after after I left high school, I went to Hobart Art School for oh, I don't know, about six months or something like that. Uh, and then I uh, I managed to get a uh, a gig with a guy named Tony Worsley, who was a big star. Back in those days, and uh, in Tasmania, up, in Tasmania no, or Australia? No, no, he, around Australia. He came yeah. to Hobart to do a show, and I'd read in the old Go Set magazine where he'd just lost uh, Vince Maloney, his guitar player, had gone off to join the Bee Gees, and um, so I asked him if he was interested in me, and I ended up two days later in Melbourne in the Big Smoke. Oh wow, that's a that's a that's a very uh, quick transition from your local territory over to, I suppose, Melbourne. Where uh, was it? Was it the um, music capital of Australia at that stage, or was Sydney? Well, it depends who you were talking to. Yeah. If you were talking to someone from Melbourne, most definitely. If you were talking to someone from Sydney, no. Well, Sydney you know, capital. from my <laughs> yeah, from my experience, um, from the amount of acts that we had at Mushroom. We could never get the same amount of gigs in Sydney that we could get in Melbourne. No, well, I, I think I think there was this perception uh, back in in the like in the sixties and seventies that there was uh, this misguided perception that a lot of the record company people had, uh, and that was that seeing as their headquarters were in Sydney, yes. Sydney was the centre of the music industry. That's right. Uh, it it never was. No. Uh, as far as live music and venues were concerned, Melbourne was always streets ahead. Uh, and, uh, I mean, really, when I look back at those times, Melbourne was almost... Uh, Melbourne was almost as strong as the rest of Australia collectively. Yeah. It was... Yeah. Uh, there was just a fantastic uh, amount of, of music around and, and venues to play in. And uh, and, and the other thing is, uh, I think, you know, one of the big differences that's always existed between Melbourne and Sydney is that Melbourne as a city is a schmodel. You know, it, uh, Melbourne's a really organised place, as you would well know. Yeah. We have great pu public, always have had great public transport. Um, so, you know, uh, there was... Lots, lots of venues in the city. Well, tell, uh, well, tell me. Let's just pull it back a bit. Now you've um, you've come to Melbourne, and I always like to know, like, what kind of guitar were you playing at the time? Um, at that time, I had a <laughs> I had a, a nineteen fifty seven Stratocaster, which would have been a, worth a fortune today. Oh my God, fifty seven <laughs> Strat. Yeah, fifty. Uh, which I'd sort of. I had a harmony guitar I'd bought, and I'd had a. I I I worked in my dad's shop for a while, and yeah. uh, uh, got. I had this originally a, an old German Hoyer guitar put out under the name of Broadway, which I which I still have actually, and then I had a a, a, a Gibson SG Junior. What colour was that? Red. Yeah, very, red, very, I've, I've yeah, always, very typical always red. Led, always led, to, uh, always like red guitars. I eventually ended up with a Strat, and because I, I uh, at that stage I was a bit of a fan of the Yardbirds and Jeff Beck and everything. I wanted the Telecaster, and there were none around, so I chopped up the Strat and made it look like Telecaster. Well, well, <laughs> tell me what, because you obviously had an SG Junior. What pushed you more towards a uh, a Fender? Um, than a Gibson. Well, initially in those days, the fact of who was playing what. Right. You know, if, if one of my heroes, like Jeff Beck or Clapton or or, or someone like that, but, well, no, they were, you know, there was George Harrison and there was Keith Richards. Yeah. And then there were the, the, the guys in the in the yard birds. Of um, course there was the who and... Uh, yeah, uh, and all yeah. that. that yeah. And, 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 you know, 
we all wanted guitars like they had. Gotcha. Um, so, so so you, you kind of made it your guitar too, didn't you? I, realistically, you've been more a Fender guitar user than a Gibson. Would I be correct yeah, in saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I went through a period in the late 60s where I, uh, I had a Gibson uh, 345, a Gibson yep. stereo, yep. like B.B. King. Yes. And uh, But by the time... Matt Taylor uh, came and joined the band, yeah. came and joined Chain. I definitely moved over towards more Fender. Well, you know, part, partially influenced, I guess, by Jimi Hendrix. Mm. But, and also, uh, previous to that, I went through a stage where I had a, uh, a Fender Jazz Master mm. and I got to really like having a tremolo arm on yeah. it. You yeah, know. yeah. So I, in the early Jane days, after Matt Taylor joined, yeah, because we have Jane. Well, let's let's Jane, just let's Jane. just pull that back a little bit and go for for the audience. Yeah, you you were with Chain, and then uh, Matt Taylor joined after that. Correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was in a band. I went to Perth for a while in a band called Beat and Tracks. Yeah, we came back to Melbourne. Got Wendy Saddington as a singer, yeah, uh, and changed the name to Chain. That was in 1968. Yeah, late 1968. Uh, Matt Taylor joined two years later. So 70. Uh, yeah, 1970. Wow. So okay. So then you've got Matt Taylor. We've got uh, Chain happening, and in that year is Black and Blue written. Uh, yeah, Black and Blue would have been well. Uh, it was actually Black and Blue was written. At our first rehearsal, right when Matt came up to, because at that stage uh, Barry Sullivan, Barry Harvey, and myself yeah. were living in Br- we moved up to Brisbane from Sydney, yeah, and uh, we were doing a few gigs around Brisbane and wondering what we were going to do. And I, I suggested we got Matt as a singer, mm. and then when, when Matt joined, we. we as I said we wrote Black and Blue the first time, and then Matt said, "Look, I've." I've got this young guy in Melbourne who works for one of the agencies. He, he'd be interested in managing us. Yeah. And so uh, that was Michael Gadinsky. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, okay. So we, uh, on our way back to Melbourne, we stopped off at festival studios in Sydney and yeah. recorded Black and Blue. Wow. And, and then headed off to Melbourne and, and started working with Michael. Now was it was it now was it a hit when it was released first, or did it take a bit of time to get momentum? No, it took a bit of time. Basically, look, it, 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 uh, some of the radio stations didn't want to know about it because at the time, at, in the you know, nineteen seventy, early nineteen seventy one, mm, yeah, uh, everything was very poppy, yeah, and really, at the end of the day, black and blues a dirge. It's really a slow piece of music. And, yeah, you would never uh, have thought it'd be a commercial hit. That's for sure. No, and yet our audience has loved it. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. I, I'll, I'll let the listeners into a little secret here. Yeah. Back in those days, uh, every week, record shops would report how many records they'd sold by a particular artist, you know. Correct. If Bob, if Bob Dylan had a new single out, you know, all the, rec- all the label, all the, all the record companies would report Correct. to... The uh, I can't remember even the name of it now, but it was like it, like an Australian billboard type thing yep. that would determine the place on the charts next week. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, if, if you were number fifty on the charts and you sold a shitload in a in a week, you might go up to number thirty two or yeah. even higher. You know, and so we, we didn't actually work this out till later on. But what Michael did, what what, what, it, what it appears that Michael did was. He'd go around all the record shops and buy it up. Buy, up, buy all the singles up, and then he'd put us on at one of his dances on a Saturday night. You'd have to pay to get into the to see the band, and built into that, he'd say, "Plus, get a free copy of Chain Singles." So he'd buy the singles for probably seventy cents each or whatever yeah. they were at the yeah. time. He'd charge a dollar fifty to get into the dance, and he'd give you a single. So he was getting. <laughs> He was getting his money back, and of course, what happened was it gave it enough momentum yeah. to get into the charts, and then the record, the, the radio yeah, stations, stations start playing. Had, yeah, had to play it yeah. because once it was in the chart, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get denied. No, that's right. To, to, to be and played. did it actually go to number one, Phil? Yeah, 
Yeah, in Melbourne, in Victoria it did, yeah. yeah fantastic, um, so shot to number one. Well, tell me, so that's the black and blue story, right? Yeah. What was the, I always wonder, what was the next song that came out? The next single was Judgment. Right, okay, another cracker, absolutely. I mean, now this comes off Towards the Blues? Uh, no, Judgment wasn't on Towards the Blues, actually. Towards the Blues was recorded before we recorded Judgment. Yeah. In fact, we, when we recorded Towards the Blues, the, uh, the, the record company wanted to put the single on the album. Yeah. Because they thought it would be a great selling point to have it. And we put our foot down and said we didn't want that mm. because it wasn't indicative of the way the album was sound. It wasn't. It would have stuck out like a sore thumb. Now, you're referring to Black and Blue, are you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, because ju Judgment Day to me, uh, so, sorry, Towards the Blues to me, is one of those records where there's not one bad track on the album. And you know, it's hard to come by those kind of albums. And every track is just sensational. I mean, it, you know, and you really would listen to it and be super proud of it because they're all just fantastic tracks. And you are right. I reckon that Black and Blue wouldn't fit in the mix if, say, you had it in track three or whatever, you know? No, it wouldn't. So uh, under pressure, we didn't even want to do this, but under pressure from the record company, we said, all right, we don't want to put the single on it, but what we'll do is we'll do it a, a, a new version of it in the studio as yeah. part of this thing. Yeah. So the, the, as a result, the, ver the bl version that's on Toward the Blues is a different version. Yeah. Um, aspects of it I, I like better, aspects I don't like as yeah. much as yeah, gotcha. single. Yeah. But it, it meant that it was a cohesive album. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, we went into the studio for four or five days Mm. The first couple of days or so, we we did uh, absolutely nothing. I mean, we just, we just it sounded terrible. We couldn't get our shit together, basically. Yeah. I yeah. don't know what it was. And, and then, I don't know, maybe we got the combination of the scotch and the, and the smoke to get right. I don't yeah, know. You mean cigarettes. I'm, I know what you mean. Oh, I'm, oh of course, yeah. yes. Definitely cigarettes, yeah. yes. Um, yes. And it all came together. Especially those... Those cigarettes that, that were grown in Thailand. And yeah, yeah, like they that. got those funny smells to them. But that's yeah. now, tell me, so that's ju that's Towards the Blues. And does the band break up at the end of that? No, we did. We recorded Judgment after that. Yeah. And uh, Judgment went well. But yeah. gradually what happened was we were, we were actually getting burnt out because we'd been working, you know, all of us for years had been working in bands and, and the culmination of this with Chain having uh, uh, Black and Blue on the charts and Judgment on the charts is we were doing like six gigs a week, you know, six, seven gigs a week. And back then, and, uh, what kind of audience were you picking up? Was it 200, well, 400? It, oh, it, it really varied, you know, yeah. you know Sometimes you might play at a, uh, a school to 600 yeah. kids, you yes. know. Yep. Uh, other times it might be, uh, you know, 150 people in a little club. But yeah, yeah. We were always getting really great crowds. They were really into it and really listening. Mm. Uh, and, and as well as that, it started moving into pubs. That was another scenario as well because then as well, uh, up until it started moving into the pubs, we had – audiences that really listen to us you know now tell Maybe. me tell me let's stick to that for a second because up until that point your pubs were closing at six o'clock correct and then they moved it to was it 10 o'clock something like yeah, that or 11 o'clock and it allowed yeah. artists to go into pubs and play correct that's right yeah, yeah. Big move, really successful for the music industry. Um, and, you know, this has come up in other interviews, really led the way for, you know, the, the success of our bands being able to get to their audiences. It really did change the landscape, no doubt about it. Yeah, so, well, it, cha yep, it oh. cha changed, the, uh, changed the landscape to some degree. Uh, I've always sort of thought it changed, it changed it to some degree in a good way. Mm. Uh, but one of the things that got lost along the way, mm. I think, was that eventually everything became that. Yeah. Everything became a, a drinking environment, yeah. a pub environment. Yeah. And so there were aspects of, of music. Yeah. That sort of faded away. You know, there's an uh, irony to what you're saying, don't you? I'm just going to pull it back a bit and go, there's an irony yeah. there. Is you're telling me about 
uh, smoking cigarettes, I mean just cigarettes, <laughs> and the booze, and how that becomes creative, and now you're telling me <laughs> the, the venue where the punters want to have a drink <laughs> is a little bit different. <laughs> oh, I, got well, you, I got you on that one, Phil. <laughs> yeah, no, you have indeed. But, um, uh, that, that's, that's sort of the way, the way it turned out. Well, um, well, well, I think I kind of get what you're saying because you probably would have had a more attentive audience pre that and then once you get to the pub and there's the drinking and there's everything else that's going on around there, you could actually be playing to an audience that are just all talking and, you know, it's a, how many are listening is another part of it. And well, it, well that's, yeah. and that's part of the... Uh, that's part of the reason why bands became so loud. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, once you get into a, a pub with, uh, you know, 600 people all drinking and yeah. and in party mode, uh, you had to play over the top of them. Well, I think uh, if you remember too what happened, was it maybe the late 70s that uh, then they had to, they went later the licences got extended, but to have an extended licence, you actually had to serve some food. So we'd all get down, say that the Prospect Hill was a cracker, we get down there and you'd get dim sims or a bowl of chips <laughs> at 10 o'clock, yeah. and that gave them their justification for their late licence, right? And if you were lucky yeah. enough, you got two servings, so that was fantastic, you know. <laughs> and the room was full of cigarette smoke, because you could smoke, of course, so you were dying of uh, lung cancer in the process, and, you know, but look, so we've got, so Chain then uh, records Judgment, then does it formally kind of fold from there for that period? Well, no, it, it, it sort of, it, it folded in dribs and drabs. Uh, mm. it, it, as I said, we were, we were getting burnt out by yeah. just playing uh, night after night after night after night. Yeah. And we, we weren't really developing any new music yeah it, 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 it sort of it stagnated because of this overwork situation yeah and first little goose the drummer left he wanted to go and play jazz yeah and then uh, Barry Sullivan left because he couldn't he couldn't dig playing with well, he could, didn't really enjoy playing with the drummer that would play little goose yeah and then it was, it was all over the bloody place by then I left I wanted to do other things, and then so Matt was uh, Matt was left with this sort of messy, sort of um, not very well rehearsed band. Yeah, and then Matt Matt went and joined uh, a commune. That's right. He tells and me about uh, all the chickens up there. Yeah, in the commune, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got that. And, uh, There's a lot of uh, drug drug uh, participation. He said a lot of hallucinations. And uh, yeah. he doesn't quite remember that period quite well because it was just a haze. Yeah, that's right. Well, let, well, well so, that's... so he's gone up there and he's doing that. Now, we, we, we get to, what, 72, 73, and uh, you, you're in various kind of uh, combinations of act, uh, artists, but do we move then to I Wish There Was A Way, which is a sensational record for, uh, you know, if you don't say yourself, I'll tell you it is. And it, it really well-crafted record uh, with depth, colour, in, and, you know, not necessarily a hard rock album. I'll call, I'll call, no, I'll no, call no. Chain a rock band, not a blues band. You're yeah. a rock band, but, yeah. you know. And this was a complete 180 from what we knew you were doing, correct? Yeah, and that was one of the reasons why I, I got out of chain for a time there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was that I, I was writing all this material. Uh, I, I was practising a lot of uh, sort of classical guitar exercises and, and I, I, I was moving in a different direction. So the opportunity came up to do I Wish There Was A Way. And in retrospect... Uh, aspects of it were really were really good. In fact, I, I listened to the whole thing myself not long ago, and I thought, yeah, it's all it's all right. I like that song, and I like this. I like the way the whole thing's put together. There's some great musicianship on it. Mark Kennedy mm. and Big Goose on bass, and Mal uh, Mal Logan was it? Yeah, on on keyboards and stuff. Steve Cooney was on some mandolin and some didgeridoo. Wow. I think no, it, I, I I just think well it was a there was a, a, a lot of depth to that record and then we go to seventy eight is the next record so there's a, quite a, um, a a space there between recordings correct yeah well I, we we put Jane, uh, we put it put Jane back together in a couple of different lineups yeah. for a while there yeah yeah I mean after I wish there was a way 
I, I did a couple of sort of really odd, about around about that time, I did a couple of odd little singles for the Fable label. Yeah. Uh, and um, I had a little band called Willie and the Filtones, which became Band of Talabini. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, but then back into a chain lineup for a while. Then I started working with Trevor Courtney and, and Paul Wheeler. Oh, yeah, there's some names, yeah. We did a, a you know a lot of touring around the place. Then and that's moving came, towards Manning, yeah, yeah. And then became this thing where Jim Keys and I got together and started writing material and started to record an album. Yeah, uh, and the the English producer and the manager basically you know just sort of said that Jim wasn't cutting it. And from a I vocal perspective, or from a writing perspective. No, from a vocal perspective, uh, yeah. just uh, we'd recorded all the tracks, but uh, he just wasn't cutting it, unfortunately, at the time. Well, you know, um, it's, a, it's a funny record too. You and me have had discussions about Manning before. Now, oh, yeah, for everybody yeah. listening, I like the record and Phil doesn't like the record, okay? Let's just be frank about it. <laughs> I, I like it. The cover is very questionable. It wouldn't survive in 2023. It's very sexist. There's no doubt about that. I, I find the songs fairly reminiscent of that 75 to 80 period, very radio-friendly and very listenable record. And so I, I, I kind of like it, but I know you, you're you not a big fan of that record. No, well, I suppose, I suppose one of the main things is that it, it, it created a huge uh, rift between Jim Keys and myself, mm. uh, which, which luckily we got over before he passed away. Yeah. But we, we did actually do some great writing together. As you say, it was, that, it was reminiscent of that period. And you talk, talk about the period of people like Hall and Oates at that sort of, that late 70s, early 80s yeah. pop, pop thing, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Getting yeah. into that area of uh, you know, gated drums and well, it might have even been a bit before that, but uh, clever, clever pop music, really, you know. Yeah, I, and, I agree. But look, it you know it obviously didn't last, and you moved on. But then we we get to Oz Blues, correct? Yeah, Oz Blues. Uh, I, I was actually I took some time off, and I was went, uh, renting a little farm in Tasmania. Yeah, in in the back blocks and going hunting for my food and doing doing all that sort of thing. Uh, I got a phone call from Matt. You want to come over to Perth and because. Uh, uh, Dave Hole, uh, yeah, there's a name. Player, yep. uh, didn't want to continue uh, doing uh, doing that. Wanted to move on to his own thing. Mm. So yeah, so Matt and I got back together and did the Oz Blues thing for a couple of years. I mean, is that uh, where Spring Hill was written on that for that album? Uh, well, I'm I, I'm not sure. That was one of Matt's songs completely. Right. Yeah, okay. Matt Matt uh, wrote. He's a voracious writer. You know, yeah. Matt Matt's one of those guys that just writes and writes and writes and. Um, and then we uh, pull the we pull the one out of ten out of there because it's so prolific, and we go right. That's the one there because the other nine are not, yeah, yeah, not as exactly. good as that I one. Mean, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the whole thing. You might write ten songs that that, uh, that you go ho hum, and then the next one you go wow. Yeah, what's exactly, that? exactly. And uh, and, uh, and he, he's he's still exactly the same. He, he still writes piles of material, and so um, well, we get there. So we got Oz Blues, right? And it's that is for everybody listening. That is a sensational record. It is a really good record. I I think the standout track is Boogie Two, Son of Boogie. Um, a boogie being to me, uh, even if you worry whether Cant Heat did it back in the day and all that, they're the kind of the bigger ones there. But Boogie is such a a, a, a traditional pub blues rock band song, and especially between 1970 and 1980, Boogie, and that's a standout track there. But then we move to one of your uh, celebrated records, Phil Manning, It's Blues. And this is really just you and the guitar, correct? That's right, yeah. And it's just um, you delving into your guitar and your songs. Tell us a little bit about its blues. Well, I I had moved up to Tambourine Mountain in Queensland. I I was uh, starting to, to uh, work to work solo there. Just, there wasn't enough work to have a full band around up there at the time. Mm. But there was lots lots of little places around the area where he could do solo work. And um, so I was doing that. And I thought, I, 
I should record this. So basically, I went into uh, the into Sweet Sixteen Studios in Brisbane. Yeah. Uh, set up an amp in the corner. Uh, ran my acoustic guitar into that, put some mics on the guitar and a vocal mic, sat there, put a little table beside myself, uh, had a, a, a bottle of wine sitting there and, and basically just sort of sipped away and did a gig. Wow. So basically, I just, I just basically played as if I was on stage somewhere. I, I had a whole set worked out, a yeah. big long set, went for maybe an hour or something like that. Yeah. So I did that, went in, uh, had a bit of a listen to what the sound, you know, went in and had a listen to it. And said, and then I said, all right, let's, I'll do it again. And I went back and did the whole set again. And this and came then, out on vinyl, yeah? Yeah. And we out of that like, two sets that I did, we just picked the, the best the best of, uh, uh, of of each take, you yeah. know, the best, best take of them. And, uh, yeah, and it came out originally on vinyl, I... I I did it all myself. So I, I pressed uh, 250 vinyl and a bunch of CD, uh, a bunch of cassettes. Yeah. But at that time, CDs had just come out, oh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and in between getting that batch of 250 vinyl done, yeah, and using them all up, the uh, the, the vinyl pa- uh, vinyl plants closed down. Wow. Because everyone moved over to C D. So most of those uh, those two hundred and fifty vinyl, most of them went out to the radio stations for promotion, and really, I don't know how many ended up getting sold uh, around the place. I had a distributor for it and all that stuff. Oh, well, they'd be worth um, gold today. Yeah, I guess they would be. And then I had, uh, and then I, it was a bit of a sad story, really. I, the cassettes were selling like hotcakes, and then the distributor went broke, and they had an absolute huge pile of my cassettes on on, you know, on consignment yeah. to them, and they uh, they went belly up, and I didn't find out about it until after everything had been wound up, and so the cassettes had been sold off to someone. <laughs> 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 so it was all a bit of a joke, but I kept on pressing the cassettes. Yeah, and uh, I ended up I ended up selling thousands of them. Yeah. It was amazing. Well, because the cassettes were very cheap, you know. Well, we go cheap. we go from there. We move to can't stop. Now, can't stop to me is back to your rock roots. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's probably more a blues album than a well, rock album. Yeah, look, it, I, it's got I, you know, I, look, I know you're a b- blues player, but everybody knows Phil Manning as that Australian rock blues guitarist. So yeah, 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 if I say rock, but you're more, you're more, you're a blues player essentially. But you know, you just get across. I think that that border uh, there, and you're rock also. But it is a, this is a loud record. Yeah, um, yes, no, it, uh, it, it's recorded rather well. Uh, once again, that that um, that album was done in two days, I think. Oh, really. Yeah. And why and why pick Sweet Home Chicago on there? Uh, oh, cuz I I guess I wanted to play uh, so it was actually Sweet Country Home. It really um, it, it really so it's Sweet Country Home and it's listed as Sweet Home Chicago. Yeah, well there was a there was a <laughs> um a, a legal thing that came into it. Yeah. I I wrote Sweet Country Home using a basic format. Yeah. Uh, which was different to Sweet Home Chicago. Yes. Um, but I did the silliest thing on the album cover. I put that it was adapted from Robert Johnson. Right. If I put it was inspired by Robert Johnson, yeah. it wouldn't have been a problem. Yeah. But because of the use, my use of the word adaption, yeah. the, the they new pe- yeah. people who just recently acquired control of Robert Johnson's catalogue yeah. you know, basically got their knickers in a knot over it. So yeah, but it, it actually, you know, I should, I should have probably, as I said, I should have said inspired by, uh, and and then they, you would have had to worry about it because it, it wasn't just uh, Robert Johnson that inspired. It was a whole pile of different people that inspired that style of mm. writing, that style of playing, mm. and um, uh, and uh, and of course, uh, very little of what Robert Johnson actually recorded was really original music. It was all part of the heritage, the sort of um, 30s, 40s, you know, blues lot, and all the that. The long history, long history of, of blues yeah. uh, styles that went before him, you know. Mm. 
And um, so I, I got I got I got my knickers in a knot over that. And uh, I, at the time, I just I just thought it was a, a rather cynical grab for control of a bunch of material that, through a tech, through a te- through a, a technicality, mm. uh, wasn't in the public domain. Um, there was a oh, anyway without boring your listeners a bit. Uh, it was actually meant to be sweet country home, and it was uh, a little nod. To blues people. Well, you know, interestingly, you talking about your song like that is uh, in a discussion with Neil Johns from Blackfeather, um, uh, Bop and the Blues, he never got credited for because uh, I've forgotten the country artist in America who'd written a song called Bop and the Blues. And you remember, you're going back to what, 1972 um, or whatever. And um, it was was originally. It was actually a record put out by Carl Perkins. That's it, Carl Perkins. So uh, at the time, the publisher said, no, it's a Carl Perkins song, and he said he never got a cent from it. And he said, but I wrote that song, and it was a, it's different from the Carl Perkins song. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's, you know, that's a story, uh, you know, we discussed. But so we, we move on from there, and you get to the back shed, and we get to two roads, and then we get to take note but to me you're moving more towards a um a folk blues style would that be correct very, very much well um yeah very much because um i about that time after i did it's blues and and uh can't stop yeah i realized that what i would like to do would be able to record at home so i went and bought myself a whole pile of some of the uh, new state of the art at the time yeah. equipment, yeah, uh, and I, I was working mainly solo, yeah. And so I, I was doing folk festivals, I was doing little blues festivals, I was even doing the Gimpy Muster, yeah, and um, uh, country festivals. Uh, they even put me on because of the folk blues thing that I was doing. They even put me on a lot of jazz festivals, yeah, yeah. So it, it was a really sensible thing for me to do. And um, having my own gear to record it meant that I could do it at my own leisure. I could, you know, basically, if I wasted a week on a song, it didn't matter. You know, it didn't cost me an arm and a leg. And, um, it, and it totally makes sense. And, I mean, uh, you know, in between all of this, we've worked on a lot of your old tapes and uh, quarter-inch tapes that you had, and we have found some gems in there. And for the audience... Um, uh, for example, a Phil Manning, Phil, Phil Manning live at uh, Dallas Brooks Hall, which doesn't exist anymore, but we know what a, a, a fantastic venue that was. And, you know, you get little gems like this come out, which are great. I, I do remember for everybody listening, he did give me a, a box of tapes, which was when he supported Canned Heat. Unfortunately, we couldn't get anything off those tapes. They were unsalvageable. That's where we got this batch of songs from. And then... We've got Phil Manning, rock, uh, rock and Roll Trio, you know, again, which is, you know, a little EP. And then we've got... Yeah, Live. I, I think, I think that, that's, that may have come off cassette even. Yes, I um, think you're right. Absolutely yeah. right. And then there's, there's another one that we play here in the office at Laneway quite regularly, and, and that is um, Live Melbourne 73, which I'm, I can't remember whether you gave it to me or Matt Taylor gave it to me. And it was an old quarter-inch tape from 73, which he said was recorded on a two-track. It just someone had gone in with a two-track, put some microphones up. And that was at that... Fa- what was the club? It was closing. Um, Garrison. That's it. That's it. And this is from there. And what we're just lucky at the time. And, and that's what it's like when you, you're given a lot of these quarter-inch tapes. And if I remember correctly, this tape had mould... <laughs> the sides of it obviously that was a good thing because it protected that uh that tape and we were able to salvage it in very good condition and it is a uh a, just a terrific record and it goes back to 73 and it does show it's not a chain record um there's a lot of guest people playing on it but it's essentially matt taylor and phil manning and, and the different guises that you guys played in is just unbelievable and 
and there's a couple of jams on that release which again are just fantastic just fantastic there's a song called various australia and that is again fan what a fantastic song there's krishna loves you too which is i think a matt taylor song isn't it um, yeah, 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 and that is just great. And it just, you know, then, you know, and, and then we get to some later stuff of yours, which I can say quite honestly, you've come back to a little bit more contemporary music again. And that, for example, shut downtown and worn out shoes and things like that, where to me, you've come back to a very contemporary sound, which, you know, could quite easily fit fit into Radio Land, you know. No, in fact, in, in fact uh, I just got the chart this week. It's uh, number four, and the, the album's number four in the Australian Blues and Roots chart. Now, which one's that? Uh, the, the one that's put out by all the Blues and Roots No, programs. no, no, which, which record? Oh, Out of My Shed. Ah, yeah, gotcha, okay, gotcha, yeah. The, the new one. Yeah, and that is just fantastic, and I mean... Um, it, so yeah, you see this complete transition for you. You do you do bop around all over the place. So you get into this folky blues thing, and then you come back and there's some contemporary. Then we find some old stuff there, which is straight out more rock than kind of blues. You're just jamming, and it's just fantastic. And that depth and quality is pretty hard to find these days. I think. Of course, you had the advantage of being able to do so many gigs. And you're, you know, you're seasoned right across the board, but yeah, and and also I was, I was very fortunate in the early seventies uh, in that I got into the in, into the session work field, yeah, uh, playing on other people's records, and that uh, that exposed me to to a lot of different things, like you know, going in with you know a twelve piece rhythm section and seventy mem or ninety members of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. To do a, to do a Kamal album, you know. Oh wow! Uh, Did you ever play uh, with Renee Gaia? Uh, I I played with some gigs with Renee. Yeah, uh, with the Phil Manning band, one right. of the Phil Manning bands backing her, uh, and I played on uh, the first album she did when she came down to Melbourne. All oh, right, um, the one that had "It's a Man's World." Oh on. wow! So I, I played on that, although the guitar, the guitar, the solo guitar on "It's a Man's World" is actually Tim Gaze. Timmy Gaze. Oh, Tim Gaze, really? Mm. And it was yeah. a bass player, it was the chain bass player on there with her anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, Barry Sullivan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Barry was on everything. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I mean, there's that wide berth there. I mean, how... We started off talking about your guitars and what you had back in the late 60s, early 70s, and what are you actually playing these days? Well, um, in, in 1988... I became a Fender artist, a Fender Australia In, artist. Endorsed artist, yeah. Endorsed artist. And um, so ever since then, I've been mainly playing Fenders. I mean, I, I, uh, I had, I, I had uh, Guild acoustics for a while. Um, then I had a Fender acoustic for a while. My, as far as electrics are concerned, mm. I uh, have played an Eric Clapton Strat since uh, 19... 88, uh, and I've got a Fender Powerhouse Strat, which I use for slide. Mm. During lockdown, uh, the, in recent years, I've developed some arthritis in my left hand. Yes. So I started using, but that was a, a funny thing, it happened by accident, but I, I've ended up uh, using Cole Clark, what they call little lady guitars, Cole yeah. Clark LL series. And I have, um, I have had a little bit of a play on those. You let, generously yeah. let me touch it. <laughs> and they're, they're a short, they're a short scale guitar. Yeah. And I found that I really like that. So during lockdown, with all this COVID business, yeah, I built myself a Telecaster from scratch. Wow. Using uh, pieces of pine that I had around the house. Yes. A couple, couple of little bits from Bunnings, and yeah. Uh, ended up, to, I talked to Cole Clark, and they gave me a fingerboard off an LL. So I've got a fingerboard on. On that, the same as my acoustics now. Oh, really? And then just before Blues Fest this year, I really wanted a Strat that was a short-scale Strat, and I discovered that the, the Japanese were making one, uh, what they call a junior series. Is that because and they're it, shorter people than us, is it? Well, I, more, um, I think they're, they're more for students, you know, more for kids. 
I hope, I, hope I wasn't joking with that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell me, tell me something too, Phil. Why have you not? I've seen a few pictures of you with them. Why have you not really played a semi-acoustic or you know hollow-bodied electric guitar? You have, well, but not commonly. No, well, I. I is it I, the, is it the tinniness of the sound or the? Uh, no, no, no. They they usually rounder a rounder sound than a strat or a telly. Uh, it depends on whether they've got a solid block up the middle. If they've got a solid block up the middle, yeah, you can get a reasonable amount of level out of them before they feed back. But right. Um, well, put it this way: what I sort of find is that with a strat or a telly, mm. telly, you can reproduce just about any other guitar. But right. it doesn't work the other way. Yeah. If if you've got a a, a semi solid guitar, mm. it's just about impossible to make it sound like a strat. Yeah. A, a, a noticeable exception actually was the guitar I designed back in the seventies, mm. which came out as a Phil Manning model stereo with Maiden, mm. which uh, was really successful for a couple of years, uh, and that's actually a ripper. That that really crosses the the uh, crosses the border quite well. Did you ever ever keep one of those maintenance? Oh, I've got the original. I kept the original prototype, but uh, I gave that to my son for his twenty first. Oh, actually. fantastic! Oh, absolutely! Oh, great! Oh, yeah. That, what was that? A sunburst or was it a red? Uh, no, it, it was originally a blonde, very lovely, golden blonde. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, but but me being the typical idiot that I am yeah. at times. Uh, painted it Monaro red. Oh, really? Because that's why I knew you were a red lover. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, the, uh, as I was saying, I, I've got this junior uh, Japanese strap now. Yeah. Is that, uh, and that's the red one, isn't it, that I've seen? No, no, that's, no? My, my, that's my Clapton strap, which right. is actually sitting, sitting here staring at me in the room. Well, what colour is the, uh, the, 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 let's the, call it the one, junior? Yeah. It's called Daphne Blue. Oh, right, okay. It sounds very suspect doesn't it yeah yeah it does actually and i don't think i've seen you play that one have i <laughs> no no well actually i, I played it um uh, i played it when changes uh, we did a run through melbourne about a month ago oh yeah the byron bay's uh, blues kind of run yeah uh, no before that yeah. uh, about a month before that i uh, i used it there and i used it at blues fest along with my telly that uh, the, the white telecaster that I made. How did you How did you find the Byron Bay Blues Fest with the audience? I mean, you know that big crowd out front um, and the big stage. Beautiful sound there on stage. The first night we had big we had a lot, we had big problems. The first night. Mm. I mean, we are used to working on big stages. Mm. Uh, Absolutely, but you are. The the first night we just I don't know we were a bit too widely spread. Uh, we 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 were felt. I think we all felt a bit, a bit rushed. Mm. Uh, and uh, no, no one's fault. Just ourselves, you know. Mm. Just ourselves, probably nerves and things. And we didn't spend really quite as much time on fold back. And, and that we had the first night. We had real trouble hearing ourselves, and and keeping cohesive. The second night was uh, was was fabulous. Uh, we had the first night. Uh, the next day, I had lots of comments on Facebook yep. about how great it was and how much they enjoyed it. So it can't have been that bad. It was mm. just that um, from our point of view on stage, it was difficult to hear each other properly. Mm. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but Matt was absolutely right. Because on the, the second night that we played there, yeah. the lineup went. Uh, Chris Stone, Kingfish Ingram was on. Yeah. The next act was... Marcus King from the States. Yeah. Then then there was Chain. Yeah. Then there was Eric Gales oh, from yeah. the States. Yeah. Then Buddy Guy and then Joe Bonamassa. Oh, okay. So yeah. it was such a guitar-laden show mm. and we were smack dab in the middle of it. So there was just a great audience. And we w what we did was when the crew were pulling all the gear on stage for us to, to do our set, I just stepped in and I, I asked them, I said, pull the drum riser closer to the front, Yeah. pull the bass amp in, pull my guitar amps in and uh, and keep us really tight. Yeah. And and we did that and uh, it Made was fabulous, really yeah. good. And yeah. then in Melbourne, we had a, um, 
we had I thought we had a great sound in Melbourne as well, uh, but the the venue itself tended to be very echoey. Well, it, uh, I mean, Jeff Shed is going to be like that. I mean, it's not going to be sound treated. It doesn't matter what you do, you're going to get that echo, and it's that high roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, but we were very fortunate though in that the uh, the stage manager, for yeah. the stage we were on, there's a guy named old very good old friend named. Jeff Howard, and mm-hmm. um, and he made sure that everything was great. Oh, uh, fantastic! So, so we 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 had a great experience. Uh, we uh, it was, we just love it. And um, Peter Noble uh, has been very supportive of Chain. So yeah, it's, it's just a great event. Well, I thought really. he made some really great comments uh, in an interview last week, where he said, "I've been asked by many international companies, would I sell?" And he said, I have no intention of selling. It's a family business. So I'd like to hand it on to my family, my kids. And he said, so I'm, I'm, I've never I've never had in mind to sell it. And that's fantastic to hear. And at Laneway, we're the same. There's been a few approaches to say, could we buy you? And, and I, my answer is always the same, Phil. Well, we, why would we? We enjoy what we do. We, we, I genuinely get up excited every day to listen to some new music that we're going to deliver. And so I have no intention of ever, I'd like to hand it off to the family and the kids and to run it after I can't yeah, run it yeah. anymore. And and I think that's what you get from the Byron Bay Blues Festival and that's probably why it's surviving when, as he said, up the road, and we won't mention those other festivals, um, are all struggling and possibly going to go under. Yeah, the the yeah. other, other thing that happens with with a lot of festivals is that a lot of festivals are run by committees uh, and they they select uh, uh, a person or people to choose the acts and that sort of thing. Mm. And then after a period of time, because, because they're not actually committed to it financially, because it's not a family business or whatever, mm. uh, there comes a point where they say, well, I've had enough, I'm getting out. Someone younger comes in and then suddenly they don't want to know about any of the older artists mm. that they've had. Well, think um, think about um, the Hells Angels uh, shows, you know, over the years. Mm. And how many times did you play there? And it was that was another inspiration to play there. Forget what was going on around it. Uh, you know, you know where they used to have that stage, and you'd look out to that hill at the back and the trees, and it's like, oh my god. Uh, yeah, that no, was a, that was a, a great event. But you know, um, one, once again, uh, as as the uh, as the sort of um, older blokes sort of retired or mm. took back seat, the younger people coming on uh, were interested in the the same music. They wanted something heavier. Well, and you've got to remember what we're built on here and what what are our credentials yeah. over the years. Yes, we've got to support new young acts. We have to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got to filter it right through. Um, mm. You know, we're... Well, what, what, yeah. what we've found is more and more we've been having, you know, lots of kids coming, young people coming up to us mm. and saying, wow, we love your band. This band is so good. I've listened to it all my life. My grandfather used to play it. Yeah. <laughs> all my yeah. father used to play it. Well, so you know, usually, usually, usually it's been my parents played it, but <laughs> recently there's been a couple of people say, "Oh, my grandparents used to play it." Well, that's, oh, we're in that God. we're in that zone. <laughs> you you know, we're in that that age zone, aren't we? So I totally yeah. and you know, and it's like when you go to a gig, um, for some of our uh, older acts, and you know, you have a look at the audience, and yeah, they're we're all grandpas. You know, that's what we are, but we still yeah. love our music. You know, but look, you know, and I mean. Uh, <laughs> You know, here in the office today, we've been... Li- I don't know if you know, uh, we've been listening to Tom Scott and the LA Express. You ever come across Tom Scott from America? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tom yeah. Scott and the LA Express, which is a real funky jazz, um, oh, you know, um, uh, saxophone kind of, but rock in it yeah. too. Just fantastic. But, you know, we, we do we do go across all borders and we try to listen to music that's got... Uh, that's nostalgic and it's rocky and it's whatever. And I think when I look at, or I talk about Phil Manning, I think, uh, first and foremost, I think guitarist. And I think rock, blues, guitarist, that's to me. And then I have this other impression of this folk player who is very technical on an acoustic guitar. So you've, you've, had, this, uh, you've had this career where I think you've been able to transcend 
many forms of your craft uh, and, you know, you've probably seen it all. And I think... Yeah, well, I had a... You remember Trevor Lucas from Fairport Convention? Oh, yeah, yep, yep. And uh, he once he once said to me, he said, and this was years ago too, and, and uh, he said, he said I, I reckon one of the reasons why you've been able to to keep your name out there and keep working is that uh, you're a bit like a chameleon. No one knows quite what to expect next. Yeah, I think that would be right. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so it, it keeps it interesting. I think you're right. Uh, and, you know, could quite yeah. easily we could say to you, could you play on this rock album? You go, yeah, what kind of guitar do you want on it? You know. Yeah, uh, exactly. Or, you know, the, it's all those brands. And so, uh, and look, it's been a, a, a terrific pleasure talking to you and we've got a lot of records of yours out for everybody listening it just goes on and goes on. And quite frankly, there's one section to look at Phil Manning. But what we've got to try and do, there's all these side projects. and We've got to try and get them back under the Phil Manning name. Let's call it on Spotify or whatever, or Apple. Um, so that that big catalogue is there all together. Because, there, you know, there's, um, there's King Link. Uh, I think King Link's one of them, isn't there? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, there's yeah. quite a few side projects that you played where I think the only track I said to you, we can't put that out, was you guys doing um, Rocky Mountain Way. I said, that's not going on the record. <laughs> it, was, uh, <laughs> it, it just didn't work. Uh, but there is some fantastic tracks on those records. So, you know, there's a depth, uh, you know, the depth of the product coming from Phil Manning is enormous. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, Phil. Thank you very much, Vince, and a pleasure talking to you. And and we will catch up soon, what, yeah. Keep on what, doing what you're doing. We're Lane just, Ways, yeah. uh, Lane Ways a fabulous idea. You know, we'd, um, we'd love to see you live again, and we did a show with Phil last year, I think. And we'd like to do another one. We are kind of trying to get together a little festival of uh, Laneway Act, so we're thinking about that. But, you know, uh, we'd love to see you soon. Anyway, all the best, and we will talk to you soon, Phil. Thank you, Vince. Well, there you have it, another Laneway Talks. If you enjoyed that, just search Laneway Talks for more great conversations.